All right, by my clock, I've got 11.02. So why don't we get started? So our speaker has the, the full amount of time. Hi, everybody. I'm Paul Ferraro. I'm the co-director of CBEAR, along with Kent Messer. And uh, our outreach director, Mark Masters, will be here moderating uh, the session. And Laura Paul will be um, also co-hosting with me. So I want to welcome everybody to the 2022 CBEAR virtual seminar series. As many of you know, CBEAR, uh, uh, founded in 2014, is aiming to bring insights from the behavioral sciences, agro-environmental programs, and foster a culture of experimentation and evidence-based practices. We're a USDA, uh, uh, US Department of Agriculture Center of Excellence, and we're funded by awards from the US National Science Foundation, USDA National Institute for Food and Agriculture, and the Economic Research Service as well as by internal support by Johns Hopkins University and the University of Delaware. Next slide. So today's uh, virtual seminar uh, is gonna be co-hosted by CBEAR and RECAP, the Research Network on Economic Experiments for the Common Agricultural Policy, which if you were at our January meeting, you know won the 2021 CBEAR Prize for Agro-Environmental Innovation. And we're happy to be co-hosting this seminar today, featuring uh, work today from Dr. Jens Rommel and a large group of scholars uh, in Europe. Uh, uh, and he's gonna be talking about farmer risk attitudes and 11 European farming systems. So welcome everybody. I'm gonna hand it over to Laura. Oh, I have one more announcement. Thank you. Uh, if for those of you who are at the other seminar series, you would know this, but if you have not heard that food policy is hosting a special issue in applying behavioral science to agriculture, food, and agro-environmental policy, guest editors are Kent, uh, Pallavi Shukla, and myself, uh, and we're welcoming uh, in, um, uh, papers from uh, all sorts of agricultural and environmental related behavioral work. Deadline's August 31st, and you can go to the food policy website to see more information about the special issue. All right, now I'm gonna turn it over to Laura, thanks. Awesome, Paul, thank you. Uh, great, so uh, just some quick housekeeping. So as, as usual, we will uh, keep everyone muted for the, for the whole seminar, but we uh, encourage, strongly encourage you to submit questions via the chat throughout at any point. And all of the questions will be compiled for a question and answer session uh, led by Mark Masters at the end of the seminar. So please uh, use the chat function and also be sure to join us next on March 21st for our next seminar uh, with Dr. Hong Li Feng. So today I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Jens Rommel. Uh, Jens is an associate professor in the Department of Economics at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences and is a board member of RECAP, as you mentioned. Uh, he is a member of the Decision Making and Managerial Behavior Research Group at the university, and his research uses field experiments to understand farmers and consumer behavior. Uh, so we're really excited to turn it over to you, Jens. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, great honor to be here. Um, so the work I'm presenting today is really, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very long list of authors. It was a great team effort um, involving researchers from almost all over Europe. We cover Eastern Europe, Northern Europe, Central Europe, Southern Europe. Um, Title slightly changed. It's farmers' risk preference in 11 European farming systems. We call it farming systems because we only cover 10 countries, but we have two different uh, data collections going on in, in France. And we have the subtitle Multi Country Replication of uh, Bosqueo et al. from 2014. Um, yeah, I kind of co coordinated the study and I'm giving you some background on how we came about to, to engage in this effort. Julian, um, second author here dealt with much of the econometrics and he's joining so he can also give some answer some questions and then there's plenty of people joining who with whom together we developed the study discussed and then all local teams organize data collections in uh, these 10 countries uh, 11 farming systems so this talk today what i'm trying to do is 
give you a bit of a broader perspective. I think the audience in these seminars has been diverse. I mean, some of you will know a lot of things, but others um, maybe would like to get a bit more of a meta perspective. So why did we replicate the study? Give you some background on the original study, some background on how we organized and set this up, because I think that's probably uh, interesting within CBEAR recap context, like how to how we thought about collecting a multi-country data set and what kind of challenges uh, we face, give you some overview on the results, some like broader lessons learned, and that's a bit kind of speculative, reflective also for my part. And then want to give you a bit of a preview on one of uh, the side projects we have been uh, able to realize, which was like, predicting the outcomes of, of, of this large scale experiment that we did. And it's great to see so many co-authors also among the audience. So I think, um, I hope that they can also contribute to the discussion maybe because yeah, we, at the end we were 28. So, and it's great to have Leah's talk last week and uh, I had these slides already, no, it was not last week, two weeks ago. Um, I had these slides already prepared, but I think within CBEAR and RECAP, that's probably well known, but there is this kind of um, publication bias, one could say that we find these um, weirdly two humped um, shaped distributions of uh, p-values uh, or like test statistics that are pretty much an indication for the literature being biased towards studies that just make the, 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 the threshold, which has been like originally done by Baudet and others, but then I think Paul and uh, Pallavi have done this uh, environmental economic studies. And I think you're working on something related to, to agriculture economics uh, in, the, in the same spirit to study this literature and, and one way out to maybe address some of these problems in our literature are replications. It's of course only one facet and Leah has talked about this, but there's this big uh, replication study of uh, research in economics done by uh, Colin Kemmerer, Anna Dreber and, and others. And they have replicated all 18 between subjects lab experiments published in the QGA and AER between 2011 and 2014. And this was, I think probably the biggest so far uh, attempt in economics to um, to replicate a large number of studies. So what, what did they do? They took these 18 studies, did power calculations for the original effect size, gave the authors a fair chance of going with 90% power. So increasing a bit from the standard 80 to make sure that they are at least able to find um, the original effect 90% of the time use different indicators to, um, to estimate how well the study predicted, whether or not there's a statistically significant effect. Um, that's a binary criterion, but like if the replication uh, uses the same effect size and these effect size are like unbiased estimate of the underlying um, uh, effect in the population, we should find a statistically significant finding here 90% or, or more of the time given uh, those uh, power, this, the, this better error of 10% or less uh, they have worked with. They look at the relative effect size, so the effect size of the replication in relation to the original study, uh, original point estimate within the 95% uh, confidence interval. They elicit survey belief and prediction markets, and then also do a meter estimate um, of, of all these studies. So what do they find here? And I'm just putting here the relative effect sizes. Um, the dotted line on the right um, means that the effect size is 100%. And if this was an unbiased literature, we should expect all these replications to fluctuate around this uh, right dotted line. So there should be some left of the dotted line, some right, and like on average, we the, the expected value of an unbiased literature reflected of reflective of the true population effect would be 100%. But you may already see here that it's skewed toward uh, the left. There's one study here um, that is uh, very much to the right, where the effect size of the replication was more than two times as big. Um, 
as the original study, but by and large, you see, well, there's more study to the left of the data dotted line than, than to the right. And that's also what they find. Only 11 studies um, with the effect in the same direction with a p-value of uh, 5%, which in theory, if this was an unbiased literature, should be like 90% or more given their power. I mean, it could still be chance, but it's highly unlikely that this is pure chance. And the mean average effect size here where we would expect 100% um, was only about 66%. So there is probably good reasons to, to replicate studies and to, to, to revisit some of the studies, especially uh, influential ones, such as those published in top fives. And then three Germans not working in Germany, Robert Finger, Carola Gribitus, and um, Arne Henningsen came up with the idea of a special issue focusing on replications in uh, applied economic perspectives and policy, set out this call. And we as Recap, as the network thought like that's a nice opportunity because like one of our missions is also to, to promote open science and open science research practices. Um, let's take this opportunity. It was a, like the call was published almost a year before the deadline for the first stage submission. And we initiated a process as, as recap to organize a seminar um, on replications in general. And we had one of, of the authors invited from the study that I've just presented of this uh, large scale replication project. We had a few um, presentations on, on power calculations, on the need for replications, um, invited um, lots of authors to participate. And then we had a process where one could um, apply with an idea to recap, um, with a study to replicate that would then be endorsed and supported by recap, which basically meant like if there are small fees to cover for incentives or to set up a survey or so, we would have had some funds to, to support this. In the end, this was, was not necessary. The interest was not so large, but I had this idea and that was like some of the criteria I went through when submitting this idea that well, I guess if we want to have a experimental study replicated in, um, in an egg econ journal or an egg econ field, I thought it would be nice to, to look at farmers as decision makers rather than consumers, because I think that's, that's, that's more rare and that, that would be more within the scope of the egg econ community. Um, for log logistical uh, reasons, I wanted to do something that is just individual decision making because I imagined that it would be very hard to do experiments with strategic interdependence. I was a bit worried about sample size and setting things up and, and organizing it. So I, I wanted to keep the logistic demands low also to invite many others. It should be a study that is well established and cited. And we also cared or I cared about um, relevance beyond the the, uh, the 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 replication so we wanted to identify some parameters or something useful that can maybe also promote experiments outside of the near experimental uh, community and here we are thinking of modelers in, in particular and then just to be very clear about it like we didn't have any suspicion that there was something wrong with the study or so so we just thought like that's a key study and it's just like good scientific practice to 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 look it up and to to maybe um, replicate this in different contexts so that's the study we're talking about it's published in the european review of agricultural economics 2014 has about 150 or so citations on google scholar which is i think a a uh, reasonably large number for an experimental study. Mm, it's called expected utility maximizer, expected utility or prospect theory maximizers assessing farmers risk preference from field experiments data. And it basically uses these uh, three multiple price lists from the original paper of Tanaka and others that was published in 2010 in the, in the AER. It's these uh, price lists you see here on the, on the right. And you can use those to um, estimate prospect theory parameters. But what uh, the authors in this study do, they also estimate some structural models for expected utility theory. And the main question they're asking is, do farmers act more in accordance with uh, expected utility theory or more with cumulative prospect theory? And they 
basically compare both models and um, on, on, on various estimates. So they have these uh, structural estimates and then they use what Tanaka and others call the uh, midpoint approximation, which I will explain in a minute. So what participants have to do here, they must um, define their switching point between option A and B in, in, in three of these series. So they do not choose for every row their preferred gamble, but they choose the row where they want to move from one option to the other. So there's what we call monotonous switching in these multiple price lists. So that was enforced. So the task was to three times indicate when you would move from one um, column to the other um, to estimate those preferences. We, um, with recap, produced a three and a half uh, minute video to explain the task. Um, that was done by a, uh, mostly by a research assistant from, from Recap. So it was like a small video and we translated this to all the languages. So participating farmer had a chance to, to get a kind of video explanation because the study was done online in many cases and face-to-face -face in some others. So that's what it looked like in uh, Quartrix, which we used for all the data collection, even face-to-face, -face, we used uh, Quartrix on either mobile phones or tablets. Um, and in an online study used the questionnaire. So we had this earn model that was also part of the original um, study to uh, give a intuition for the probabilities involved. And then there were these point payoffs and there was an experimental currency unit exchange rate between points and an actual payment. And then instead of choosing uh, the preferred option for each row, they uh, had to, uh, participants had to indicate their switching point and they had to do this like three times. So what are the kind of utility functions we can estimate with this? And that's like inspired by the original study. So you have this reflected expected utility function where you just estimate this uh, parameter R here where this is the gamble, um, the, the uh, expected utility then becomes like the probability of the payoff of the gamble times uh, this part here, where y is the size of the, of the gamble. And then you just reflect this at, at zero. So for, for loss gambles, mm, you just reflect the function. So it's kind of like this S-shaped um, function that is just reflected at the, at the status quo. So it's not like a standard expected utility function that is only defined in the gain domain, but because we had losses, we have this reflected version here. We have cumulative prospect theory, which is uh, pretty much the same like this reflected version, which allows us to, uh, to uh, nest these, these, these models. And the, the main difference here is, well, this is sigma, what is R up here? But then we have this, this minus uh, lambda. So lambda is the, the um, loss aversion parameter. And you will see it on one of the next slides in the figure. It's like how steep uh, the utility functions is in the loss domain compared to the gain domain. And then we introduce probability weighting with this standard prelec function that you will also see on the next slide in a, um, in a figure that Again, like for, for gamma equal to one, uh, this weighted probability, so the probability weighting function in, in, in prospect theory basically maps a real probability into a kind of perceived probability with people usually overweighing small probabilities. And um, for, for, for gamma being one, uh, the perceived probability is equal to the real probability for lambda equal to one. Um, basically, um, there's no difference between the upper part here and the lower part. So uh, for gamma being uh, lambda being one, you end up with this reflected expected utility function up here. So it's, it's, it's nested uh, within uh, this model. And then you can directly compare these parameters uh, and have this nice nested specification. There's lots of different ways of, of doing this. You could estimate um, gamma and, uh, and lambda. Uh, you could estimate gamma and, and sigma differently in the loss and gain domain and, and could do all kinds of stuff, but that's kind of like the most simple version that also the authors of the original study used. So here's some pictures, figures taken from a, from a recent papers that also uses this task. 
And the idea here is, okay, you have this um, convex, uh, concave utility function here in the gain domain. Um, and if lambda, if, if lambda was uh, equal to one, you would just reflect this here, then you would have this reflected expected utility function like this. But then if lambda is greater than one, and here it's 4.6, um, the utility function becomes much more steep in the, in the loss domain. The idea of the probability weighting function is that you apply different um, weights to the probability. And here you see that these small probabilities for this value of alpha, it's alpha in this paper, but it's um, gamma in our case um, is overweighted. So probability of 0.1, which is somewhere here is probably like perceived as 0.16 uh, uh, under this weighting functions and then large probabilities are, are underweighted. So that's the, the, the basic utility functions we're estimating. And what we're trying to find out is, so is lambda greater than one, which would mean some, some loss aversion and is uh, alpha or in our case gamma smaller than one, which would indicate some probability weighting. So we estimate these, these parameters and that's our kind of null hypothesis is that um, lambda is one and, and gamma is one. So how did we go about this? We opened the call, distributed it on our networks, mostly within Europe, but we, we, we basically invited everyone to participate and to contribute to the data collection, to the process of setting up the survey who had some experience with data collection among farmers. Um, ideally some experience, but we insisted on some interest at least in experimental economics. Um, we set the lower le level of uh, at least 100 farmer participants from European farming systems within the deadline of the uh, special issue of the core, which was like six to nine months. And then we had a couple of sessions discussions on the joint uh, instrument uh, development. We developed the survey instrument to, together, adapted it to, to local needs. And that's like some of the challenges I would like to discuss later on with you. Um, because it's, it's really tricky to work across different legal systems, farming systems, and to look for consistency and to look for like as few experimental confounds as possible. But at the same time, you have to give some flexibility to people that operate under very different um, administrations and uh, legal frameworks. So the benefits for those teams were uh, co-authorship on the paper and uh, we we allowed everyone to collect additional data for for other research purposes after this part of the study so whatever came after was not our concern we just wanted to make sure that the survey instrument looks as similar um, for the first part as possible so the original study had a probabilistic sample of, of 107 farmers in a small area in, in French Bourgogne. So on, on the one hand, they had like pretty good data because they had uh, access to a farm registry and could randomly sample. They had a pretty high uh, response rate. So probably not a very strongly self-selected sample. They could, um, I think they had a response rate of about 70%, which probably speaks, uh, in favor of their data quality. And we had like different types of sampling and uh, uh, different sizes of sample and different si systems. We had arable farmers in Austria, Germany, the Netherlands and Sweden. We had wine growers from Croatia, potato farmers in Northern France, organic farmers in Northwest of France, olive growers in Apulia, Italy and uh, olive farmers from cooperatives in Spain young farmers from, from Slovenia, farmers of different specializations in, in Poland, total of 1,430. And that was kind of like a, a compromise to go for a large sample, but clearly these are not always random samples or near random samples. So in Sweden, for instance, we obtained data from the statistics agency on all registered farms in Sweden. And we could draw a random sample uh, of farmers that provided an email address, which was more than half of the registered farms. So we can at least define the uh, target population as all Swedish farmers that have an uh, email address registered with the statistics screen. And we can also, we have some population level statistics on them, 
but then the response rates are very low. So there's probably some, some biases from self-selection. There's some other studies like the Netherlands or, or Germany that are based on professional pharma panels. So this is probably also a different type of quality of data because you can apply some quotas and at least make sure those farmers are representative by some farm size and so on. And then some other samples were really like convenient samples. And that, that's, that's one of the main worries that, okay, how can we, how can we actually sample farmers randomly and, and get a kind of like random sample of the population. And I guess we all face this challenge. But yeah, this is uh, it's very diverse and it creates, of course, confounds in the data that are difficult to look at. So what did we estimate? We estimated a structure estimate for, for each of the samples and the pooled data using a maximum likelihood. So you, you take all these gambits, put them in a likelihood function and um, estimate a structure model. And then we use the so-called midpoint method, midpoint approach from the Tanaka paper, which basically takes the, uh, the midpoints uh, as an approximation, basically based on, on a table, depending on your choices, um, your, the, these parameters would fall within a certain interval. And then you take the midpoint as an approximation of these intervals which has the advantage that you do not estimate like one parameter for, sem for one sample or for the pool data, but you get individual level parameters. So for each of the three prospect theory parameters, you get an individual approximation, which is kind of nice if you, if you want to use covariates and um, try to, to find out whether uh, those um, parameters are correlated with any pharma characteristics or so, which is, um, not really possible with the maximum likelihood approach. You can, of course, include covariates, but not really as, as determinants. So here are some numbers, and I'm, I'm just giving you the, the, the broad overall picture. So we always include the original study. Um, we obtain the data from the, from the authors, and we can always kind of put this uh, in our in our estimation as well and directly compare our results to, to their results. They use some weighting um, by some characteristics. We use unweighted data. Um, we, we do not do any uh, weighting with population statistics because it's, it's really messy with, a, with the likelihood function, which is already kind of very complex and, and you don't get the functions to converge and it's, 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 it's a mess uh, if you would add additional weights. So we just use um, the, the, the raw data by country and look at, at these parameters. So what, what we see is where sigma, which is the curvature of the utility function in both the loss and gain domain um, for the CPT model is about 0.3. There's some small, fluctuations here, but by and large, these uh, numbers are not too, too, too big. Uh, lambda, which is the uh, parameter for probability weighting and the study I've shown before estimated a lambda of about four is in all our new samples pooled below two, which is a fairly low value if you look at, at published studies. So lambda is often at two and above. So there's like less probability uh, there's less loss aversion. So the, the, the steepness of the utility function in the, in the loss domain is, is not as steep as it is in some other studies, including the, the original study, uh, which was about 2.2. And we are even, I mean, these are confidence intervals here. They're based on, on standard errors that are assuming random samples, but if you, believe our data as almost like you, you believe you can treat this as a random sample and you estimate uh, the standard errors, then we are even lower than the original authors in, in, in loss aversion. And then for the gamma parameter for the probability weighting, we are also lower and lower here means there's more probability weighting. So the, the, the um, the, the, the probability perception is more distorted than in the original study. Um, this is from the midpoint uh, estimates. Can someone tell me how I'm doing on time? I, I have my cell phone on the other part of the room. 
Yeah, you have about uh, 15 more minutes or so. Okay, plus, great. Plus or minus, great. yeah. That, Thank that you. Should, should be perfect. Thanks. Um, so this is taken from the midpoint technique where you take these approximations uh, for, for each person based on their, on their choice. And then we can um, look at, at kernel density estimates and the distribution and, and get a bit more of an understanding of how these parameters are, are distributed for each of these samples and the original study. Funny thing is that you get like very different mean and median results here. So it's, it's really not, not linear and as simple. And it also differs a lot from the structure estimates. It actually differs more across those different estimation methods than within the sample sometimes. So that's one major takeaway that well, it, it, it's not only about the data and the samples, it's really also about the kind of approach you go for. And that's one argument in favor of pre-registration or at least putting out a kind of preferred specification to, to be clear, okay, that's that's how I think about this. This is uh, uh, the way to go. And we pre-registered um, the structure estimate as our main target. So yeah, you see there's, there's uh, some, some differences in the, um, uh, in the distribution, Spain often is a bit more homogeneous, so people cluster more here. There's a few outliers, but they are like closer to each other. Um, and then we do this for, uh, for, for Lambda also, and there you can see that the average is already much higher than the 1.7 I've shown you with the structure estimates. Uh, the, the, the medians are a bit closer to the structure estimates, but they're still way above it. So the kind of method you use um, has quite some implications on the on the results you get. And again, it's similar, but there are some smaller differences in how these parameters are distributed uh, distributed across these different samples. And then here you can see Spain is very high uh, in the middle of the version with 3.7 average and three is the, the median. And then in, in Slovenia, you have some outliers which uh, increase the, the average, but the median is still like two. And finally, the, the probability weighting parameters here, you can see Spain again, like very homogeneous, um, very much clustering around like one value. And one could speculate that this is because of the way data were collected in some of these studies, but this, that's only speculation. So. Just to, to show it once more, the, the earlier results for, uh, for, for a perspective. And if you focus on, on Lambda here, the loss aversion parameters, these numbers are really much lower than um, with, the, with the midpoint approach. These are, this is just the same table again from the paper um, that we have written and submitted to the special issue. But just to show you again, like how different uh, these values can be depending on the method you use. So to sum up the findings, like nicely, we could verify all analysis from the original authors. They were very helpful in, in providing us all the data and code. And this was all like re-estimated in Stata and R and we got the same results. So we could kind of verify the analysis. Um, by and large, there's a pretty high consistency with the uh, or, original studies, at least in the direction of the effect. So also in all our samples, farmers behavior is much better described by CPT than by expected utility theory. We have found these like differences that uh, loss aversion is smaller and probability is, 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 is greater, but it, it falls within the um, a, a similar range. And then depending on how you define the standard errors and estimate your confidence intervals, it sometimes overlaps, it sometimes doesn't. And that's also like whether you pull the data or whether you look at, at um, single samples. So there's some variability within and across samples. Um, so you've seen there's a distribution, there's some heterogeneity in terms of risk preferences in these different farming systems within samples, across samples. But, and, and I've found this the most surprising when, when doing this also between these different estimation methods that you get such widely different values when you use different methods to, to estimate those parameters. So some of the positive experiences. So I think we were all like positively surprised by our 
communication with the with the authors they were very helpful they provided like how they answered questions questionnaire everything was uh, pretty nice uh, was good that we had some french members on the team that also knew the authors and so so this was really a, a great experience so if you suspected that people do not like their study to be replicated uh, they're afraid that was definitely not the case here i think for me personally it was great to really work with with so many people across so many different countries in europe with different backgrounds and i think it, it really helped us create a network it helped us to uh, promote recap hopefully within europe and we're going to have a recap meeting in Uppsala in june you're all very welcome to to look up the um, details on the on the website we have um, many ideas generated for for site projects and we have this big uh, data set with um, potential to look really at like additional analysis uh, for, for thesis projects or for, for, for other side projects to explore some of the farming systems in, in greater detail with some of the covariates that we have not yet looked at to, to estimate different utility functions and so on and so forth. We have done a lot of this in our 80 plus page appendix for the paper, but there's still a lot of things that you, that you could do on top of this. And then one of the, um, side projects that was uh, a bit bigger and that was coordinated by our colleague Henning here at the uh, at, at SAU was to to actually ask experts to predict some of these risk preferences and that would be like the last five minutes to give you give you a short preview in, in, in this exercise because I think it's it's kind of exciting and 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 new but first some challenges we faced task was like we got lots of emails uh, relatively demanding and abstract. I guess that's that's to be expected, but we had some kind of follow-up questions that indicated that these problems for those that completed the survey were not so difficult, but we got emails. So I guess there's some self-selection, some bias going on. Those that, that completed the survey perceived it as okay, but we also received emails and feedback that well, it's it's quite abstract and 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 tedious. So this this whole coordination and so on, I think it was challenging at, at some points to coordinate so many different teams with different interests and to, to really try to bring together everyone to have a kind of homogenous data collection, but to also acknowledge the diversity in approaches in terms of sampling and what kind of payments are legally possible in each of these countries what kind of exchange rates to apply and so on and so, so forth. So like at some point we got a bit frustrated with the seemingly endless possibilities of doing ever more robustness checks on this on this data set. And then we just said, okay, let's let's stop here. I would say that, that a big challenge that, that we laid bare kind of like, okay, the, the, this so what moment of not working with random samples, like, okay, we have now a lot of self-selected or mostly self-selected um samples like what how do we really get to the core of the true underlying parameters of of the study population i think that's a big challenge for for every uh, experimentalist i would say by um by working together and working on a coherent data collection i think we're still doing better than uh, many scattered studies right so i guess it's, it's a step in the right direction we are probably not close to the or like we we don't know how close we are to the population but i think by making an effort to to really um, coordinate to try to work together and use a very similar protocol and also developing this together is much better than just sharing your your material and someone else replicating it there will always be more things wandering off a bit in the translation by keeping this constant exchange and, and working all on the same uh, basic template and then only in the very end translating it and doing these small like local adjustments i think we are at least we have made a step in the direction of a more consistent cross-country data collection and now the last five minutes um, I give you a kind of preview into this side project, which I think was also very excited. It's coordinated by my colleague Henning here. And we, we basically took the opportunity to, to ask experts across the board to, to, to make predictions on how farmers would behave in this, in this study. So there was a kind of incentivized expert predictions. So we, we choose a subset of 
of the samples for authors that, that wanted to join. So it's kind of like Henning and then a subset of the authors, including me, Julian, and a couple of others to predict the outcomes of Spain, Italy, France, Sweden, Netherlands, Germany, Poland, and Croatia. So it's not the full sample, it's only eight of the 11 samples. And we invited farm advisors from some of these countries. In, in Sweden, we are students. But then we also circulated uh, an invitation on the um, recap list and uh, on the ESA list. And we got about, I think, more than 60 or so um, expert predictions from this uh, experimental economics community. And by using different survey links, we can kind of tr track back also these, these different samples and how they do. On top of this, we had some between subject payment treatments. So we also wanted to know whether incentivizing predictions differently um, uh, makes a difference in the accuracy of predictions. So it was an experiment in itself, a methodological experiment looking at how to elicit best, best expert predictions comparing tournament schemes versus giving an incentive for the best predictions versus the control conditions where the payment was totally unrelated to the accuracy of the predictions. So there was this other kind of experimental element to it. And here, that's the only table I'm, I'm, I'm showing you. Um, we used only the first multiple price list and for simplicity, asked people to predict the average number, a certain sample would select option A in this multiple price list. And you see up here, the, the, the true means of the samples, they range from uh, five points, uh, from 6.3, so very risk uh, averse. In, in Poland to more risk loving in, uh, in Spain with 4.7 uh, with a pooled um, average number of safer choices of, of, of 5.6. That's the weighted uh, average from the, from the pooled sample. And then this, this is the average absolute deviation from the, um, from, the, um, from, from the mean. So if someone had predicted um, from, from the pooled sample that this number would be six, this number here would be 0 0.3, right? So that's the average absolute uh, deviation. So it's like either you're above or you're below the true value. It's just like the average absolute deviations. And what you can then see in the end is like who does best and what is the, the easiest uh, and most difficult to predict. So you can see that the French farmers are the easiest to predict because here the accuracy is 2.13. So on average, the deviation is only 2.1. And the Spanish farmers are the most difficult to predict because it's 2.4, but like these differences are quite small. And then here you can see our different uh, samples of forecasters. And then you can see that the researchers, the, the recap community, the ESA list, and maybe some of you have participated in this, um, do best and the <laughs> Polish farm advisors do, uh, do, do worst. Uh, so th that's quite a substantial difference here of almost uh, one unit of, 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 of accuracy. So that's just a preview. Like we have looked at the treatment effect of the, of the payment um, treatments and in total we uh, received more than 500 predictions and we don't find like any substantial treatment effects on how to incentivize predictions and even the control um, conditions where we just give a lump sum payment to participants and not incentivize any predictions does not really give us different results. So maybe in the future when we do this, we don't need to, to incentivize predictions. Maybe we do, but like at least we don't find any incentive effects, but it could also be due to the study design here. So. Um, it, it was the kind of like very abstract um, exercise. Yeah, that was it. And then you can you can email me always with questions. And I think we are willing to informally share the paper and the, the appendix. Um, yeah, we have not yet put it up as a working paper, but like we can share the latest draft and formally just send me an email and I can send you a PDF of the, the latest version of the paper. Now I'm looking forward to the discussion. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jens. Um, so uh, Mark it just had his power go out. So I'm going to get started with the conversation. So thank you so much for this, this wonderful presentation. Uh, really, really interesting work and really great teamwork with a, a big group of people. So 
I'm, I'm, I'm jumping right in. So I'm gonna start maybe from, uh, from a question at the end that I, I'm particularly interested in as well is, um, did you find that the pre-registration uh, created problems for your analysis? Like did, was there anything that came up at the end uh, or you know, after, after the fact that, uh, that was sort of uh, challenging from the pre-registration? Well, it's a large group. We are busy. So, and then prereq, I, I think you always like, uh, not everything was perfectly thought through. So in the beginning, we were very ambitious. We wanted to basically simulate all data, prepare all code and do as, as good as we can. But then like under time pressure, we ended up like doing the best we could with time pressure, put up something decent on, on, on OSF. But I, I think that's fairly standard <laughs> if you are a busy uh, researcher. I, I don't think it created any problem. I don't think like as you get into depths with the analysis, you realize some of the things. I don't think that at the time of the pre-registration, we were fully aware of these midpoint versus structure estimate differences. We hadn't thought about it that much. We had a plan that was pre-registered to, to do both, but we didn't even expect such big differences there or like we have. I, I, I don't think it's created any major problems. If we had like more resources and time, I think we would probably do like more simulations now and would have probably mm. used the pilot to do some more power calculations. So we really, yeah. like in terms of power and sample size, we really went by a rule of thumb that, okay, let's assume the original effect size is, is a good indication. Um, let's go for the, the one and the seven they had, let's, let's say a hundred is a good number and then we are we are probably good with 80 percent power and then i mean the, the these parameters they can hardly turn be, become zero so you would have to specify like differences you are able to detect between the sample rather than a, a null hypothesis because it's, it's almost impossible to get a kind of like null result um with this with this task absolutely cool that's interesting thanks all right so um Let's see, from the chat, another question here. I know there was some, some really good conversation in the chat with, with different resources. Um, so uh, one question is here, on uh, aggregating and pooling data from multi-site studies. Uh, question is whether consequential variation in treatment across sites or not. Uh, so variation in the experimental procedure that could have meaningful effect on the mechanisms through which the parameters arise. So, the procedures for sampling and payment varied across sites. And I know you mentioned that there was like a, a you know, the different exchange rate for the experimental dollars. Um, do you think that that variation uh, makes interpreting the different inferences on the pooled sample challenging? Yes, so there are lots of confounds. So if you are very strict, I mean, there's, there's tons of confounds in terms of sampling and then it involves different languages. Like if you are very strict, you could say, well, language is interpreted and like uh, some of these terms have very different meanings. So where, where do you start? Where do you stop? So as I said, I think the best thing you can do is try to bring together people, discuss a lot, translate forward and back, use your experience. And then there are all these, these confounds in terms of sampling, but also payments. So some countries paid with vouchers. In Sweden, we only paid for uh, for logistic reasons and for, for administrative reasons, only every 10 participants. So there's this kind of like extra layer of, yeah. of risk. In some countries, people were paid with uh, uh, cash and data collection in Spain was done in a group of these olive oil farmers in a meeting in Austria. It was also like meetings and it was like a general introduction and they did it like right there on their, on their phones um, in in Italy, there was a PhD student like visiting all these farmers. And, and so there, there, there was not a uniform instruction, but it was always probably slightly different procedures. And then there are all these confounds. So we really must yeah. trust our approach here that we tried our best to, to, to deviate from a joint protocol as little as possible. And if you look at any meter analysis, I would say, well, we're probably doing better than the, the typical meta analysis in mm. the sense that at least we discussed and try to to be homogenous and this is not like scattered studies and and, and yeah so I, I guess that's the the only way we can work with farmers these days so I, I guess it's very difficult to 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 work differently and I guess that's a major 
task for the future. And that's always what we stress in the conclusions that yeah. in Europe, there's this FADN, the Farm Accountancy Data Network that systematically collects um, farm accountancy data and, and some additional statistics from a certain set of, of farms. And like one could try to either use this network to implement a few survey experiment things uh, on the sample to achieve like more homogeneity or like argue at the level of the European Commission that we also need like farmer panels or quota representative farmer panels to, to do other kind of yeah. social science research to have this research infrastructure across multiple countries to, to really improve on this. That's, that's one of the points we always bring up and where we hope that maybe we can make some progress in the future that there's yeah. like, well, farmer panels we can compare. Yeah, that. that's interesting. I mean, those are some pretty pretty big differences in terms of paying, you know, one in 10 people or, or paying people as a group. Um, so that that's, that's interesting. So a related question is, uh, how many meetings did it take to, to try to harmonize all these things? Uh, what was your strategy for that? Did it, did you have a, a subgroup to, to, to make that happen or, or something else? Yeah, we had some like recap internal meetings before the deadline of the abstract. And then there was lots of emails, of course, lots of uh, Google doc editing. <laughs> and some teams joined later. So there was maybe two, three meetings after um, the abstract was submitted. And then there was like lots of individual meetings involving different people sorting out different problems. Oh. Yeah. Issues. You it's where are there particular, I mean, so it sounds like Google Docs was, was helpful. Are there particular strategies that like if you were to, you know, take on something similarly large and, and uh, uh, with as many, you know, trying to cover as much of an area as you did, would, are there any tools that you'd recommend for next time? We used Google Docs and then in Quartrix, we created like one account where everyone kind of used the translation tool and we very much insisted that, okay, this is our, base version and every deviation you make from this version for various reasons discuss it and document it properly so we have for each country the local language and an English version to also see any because in the consent form there's there's differences uh, on, yeah. the, on the payment and so on like so we were very trying to take care that everyone documents this properly of course not everyone strictly followed our <laughs> rules. It's just human if you work in such large groups, right? Like some yeah. people, there, there's still things happening. And I guess like communication is key that you anticipate all kinds of problems. And then there will always be some that you do not anticipate. But I think by and large, it was great fun and everyone did their best. And it was a, a learning experience for sure. So I I would still do it again. And we, we still had the energy to set up this prediction study, which was, was another big challenge. So we, we are not frustrated now. We are more like uh, passionate about doing more and more. Of this. Oh, that's great to hear. Yeah, excellent. Well, this has all been really great. So I think we've, a lot of the questions were sort of handled with links in the chat. So thank you to, I think these are your co-authors who have been responding to some of those questions. Um, if there's any, any more questions, you can submit them now or uh, Jens, if there were any other things you wanted to, to uh, uh, put forward, we're, we're we have a few more minutes. No, yeah, I, I would like, I want to invite everyone to uh, think about this and work on this also maybe uh, across the Atlantic and maybe also towards other continents, like uh, think of other experiments and, 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 and tasks. So here it was individual decision-making for exactly logistic reasons. So I guess like a standard public goods game or something like this would, would be nice, but it's probably much more demanding to, to, to set this up. But yeah. then I guess our consumer studies, you see lots of multi-country data collection happening anyway. But I think on the, on the farmer side, like maybe there's, there's a chance to, to work uh, across the Atlantic at some time. Yeah, that would be awesome. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. And I know everyone's giving you a big round of applause. Um, this has just been awesome and uh, really happy to have had the CBER recap co-hosted seminar featuring your, your excellent work. I mean, this is such a good example yeah. of, of the type of work that, that we are, both our groups are, are working to, to promote and spread. So uh, really, really wonderful to, to hear this presentation and thank you again. Uh, and I hope to see all of you again on March 21st. So uh, yeah. 
Thank you. And Take thanks care. to all the co-authors. I, I just checked the chat, so the, the video link and stuff, yeah. All right, goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.